apes of ancient India. Rapes meaning geography, religion, arts and writing, politics, economics, and social structures. While viewing this, if you're in my class, you should probably be taking notes. Let's begin. We'll start with geography, G. India and several other modern-day countries make up the subcontinent of India. A subcontinent is a large landmass that is smaller than a continent, but kind of juts out of a continent. You have here a map of the world, and while that's the United States, this whole part here is North America. Not quite sure why that's not correctly marked. And you have India. Large, but of the larger portion of Asia. For size comparison, you can see that India is actually almost the size of the continental Europe. That's a fairly, fairly large area. Hence, subcontinent. India is home to mountains, plains, and rivers, and is bordered by the Himalayan mountains. Yes, that is Mount Everest. Isn't that pretty? For rivers, there are the Ganges, the Indus, and the Brahmaputra. This is an image of the Ganges River, which is said to have healing powers and is very important in India. It is also the largest river delta in the world. The southern two-thirds of India is part of the Deccan Plateau, and there's an image here. There it is. And as you can see, it's relatively flat lands. So, India has all the major kinds of uh, geography. In addition to physical geography, there are monsoons, and this is part of the weather and environmental patterns that we include in geography, and they are plagued by monsoons. During the winter, cold air blows in from the Himalayan mountains, and it is very dry, very cold, not a lot of rain. During the summer, however, long rain showers occur, watering crops, but could lead to flooding. Being that I'm recording this from Orlando and that you guys are from Florida, this image should bring back some memories of our hurricanes. As you can see, the monsoon here is very large and quite intimidating. On to our religion. There are three major religions in ancient India, and that was Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. And I could not do them justice by writing everything about them in this presentation and keeping it to a shorter time span. Rest assured, we will be spending a week on the religions of India, and you will learn them thoroughly. This presentation, however, is just kind of an overview. With that being said, we're going to move on to arts and writing. The ancient writing of India is called Sanskrit, and it gave people a way to record sales, trade, and land ownerships. Similar to cuneiform in Mesopotamia, a hieroglyphics and demotic in Egypt, and the alphabet started by the Phoenicians, the early writings were for many things that happened day to day. And the reason why we know they happened, we can read. Hooray! Over time, a collection of the sacred texts were named the Vedas, and the Vedas included hymns, stories, poems, and prayers. Now, in ancient India, they believed that music was a gift from the gods, and a lot of these sacred texts were sung. Music, musical instruments, singing, was considered a very important art form in ancient India. Unfortunately, a lot of the, what we consider traditional art, the drawings and paintings that were created, they were placed in fragile materials such as paper and are not accessible today. They just cease to exist. What is left, however, is religious art that's been carved into stone, as well as large pieces of architecture. So we can see art in a functional form. This is a primary source of an art piece that did, that did make it through, and that is the Bhagavad Gita, and I totally butchered the pronunciation of that, and that is a religious text. On to P, politics. India has been captured by many civilizations before becoming an empire. Conquerors included the Aryans, who set up small kingdoms, Persians, and the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great. The first ruler of India who was part of the Indian Empire was Chandragupta, and he established a monarchy known as the Maurya Empire. We will also learn about this later. There's a DBQ we're going to do in about two weeks. Uh, get excited. And it will explain all about the Mauryan Empire and actually Chandragupta's grandson, Ashoka. 
And you can see at this time, uh, the Gupta Empire took over a, quite a good portion of India. Moving on to economics. Trade was an important part of ancient India. Salt, cloth, and iron were commonly traded. Trade partners included China, Southeast Asia, the Mediterranean, Greece, Egypt, etc. The Phoenicians and Philistines most likely would not have been uh, important traders, as they, we learned last session, were the sea people. While India has rivers and it is near water, they are not connected to the Mediterranean through water sources, so the Phoenicians most likely would not have traveled to them. In addition, economics, they would include silver and gold mines, but those are closely guarded by those who are high up in society. Which brings us to our last group, S, social structure. Ancient India was, uh, was split up into caste system, which was four separate varnas. At the top of the Brahmins, or the priests. The second group were the Kastreyas, warriors who led arm the army and government. Note that the priests are first, whereas the warriors in government are second. This is different from the other civilizations we've studied. Next were the commoners in trade. People are trade farmers, craftspeople, merchants, and finally the sudras are manual workers or servants with few rights. Most people were in this group, so that would be the largest category. On a social class pyramid, there was one other group, and that were the, those are the untouchables, and they were seen as below the caste, not even part of the caste. The untouchables did work that others would not do, and that includes touching dead bodies and carrying them, skinning animals, or collecting garbage. It was a, um, a class of people who were considered beneath everyone else to the point where they had separate walkways, separate uh, eating establishments. They weren't allowed to do a lot of things. And here you can see a, um, a social class pyramid, and you actually have the untouchables who are separated. The twice-born group refers to those who are eligible to be reincarnated, which, again, something about religion, which we will learn next week. Finally, the social structure. Each Varna had a strict set of rules for diet, marriage, and social customs. Your caste determined your career, who you married, and your daily life, and you did not move out of your caste. Uh, there weren't Cinderella stories where you were where you were suddenly lifted up by a pair of magical shoes to a, um, a different social class. You lived and died in your social class. And that concludes the very basic grapes on ancient India. We will learn a lot more in class, but I want you guys to get this overview. And with eight minutes, I think that's not bad. I'll see you in class.